Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at the Keikioka Aina Family Learning Center in Kalihi, ready to converse with the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. So here we are in the Grand Halle. In the Grand Halle, yes. What did, how did it get started? It got started because there was an opportunity for us to work with some guests from, uh, from England. And so they wanted an activity. But before that, we were carving boards and stones under a tent and sitting on gravel. So they came forward. They came I forward. A number of coincidences and yes. serendipity moments. Mm -hmm. um, and you were able to build this. Yes, building a place for us to, to house our classes and to teach is important. But I also wanted to take the opportunity to teach ancestral with, knowledge with in building with Ohia, exactly. And this is not Pili grass. On Molokai, we call it Haveni. On Oahu, they call it uh, Lolu. Isn't that interesting? Every island has their own significant exactly. names. So, so I bring who? with me my own, <laughs> my own vocabulary, my yes. own knowledge. Yes. Which is really what this place is about, right? Mm -hmm. People gather and they bring who they are yes. under one roof. Under one roof. And if we look at the construction of the, the roof and the ceiling here, it's amazing. We had people participating in making them, right? Yes, we had little children climbing. We had girls climbing. We had dads climbing. We had everybody working to build a hale. It's a very special place. It's a very special place. <laughs> Thank Much you. Much aloha. Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus and joining me in conversing with Honolulu Council Member Ikaika Anderson. Thank you for being here. Aloha, mahalo for having me. It's a beautiful location, especially for the kind of um, vision you have for Hawaii, I think. Reminds me of Windward Oahu in a lot of ways, this <laughs> setting. With the hale, absolutely beautiful. As a council member, you have a lot of responsibilities, of course, and you also have a lot of interesting ex experiences. We have many responsibilities at Honolulu Hale. Um, City Hall takes care of your most basic necessities and provides the core government services that people have come to rely on. Making sure your toilets flush, making sure your trash and your recyclables are picked up, making sure all of your city roads are paved, that your water is delivered, and that we have lifeguards and police, fire, and ambulance folks. So all of these things are provided by county government, and that's what we at Honolulu Hale do. What in the world would ever make you run for a position <laughs> Uh, where you have to take care of all those things? Great question, Lila. I was <laughs> raised by my grandparents in old Hawaiian style where they hanaied me when I was two years old. And my grandfather got elected to the State House of Representatives, my grandfather Whitney Anderson, the year I was born. My grandfather was never a public policy wonk throughout his 20 years in the legislature. But what he was from even before his time in elected office was a people person. Mm. Uh, Papa loves people. And that's really what drew him to want to serve in elective office. I grew that uh, aloha for people the same way that he had, and that's really what drove me to a career in public service. It's been difficult, it's been challenging, but at the same time, uh, very rewarding. I've enjoyed it. Coming from the windward side, you have a very different perspective to offer. Windward side is very rural, so a lot of the needs of windward Oahu differ from other parts of Honolulu, the more urban areas. Windward folks primarily want to ensure that their rural way of life stays that way and that we don't bring the hustle and bustle of Honolulu into Windward Oahu. And I've worked hard to try to keep it that way. And that's probably where the conversation of vacation rentals and visitors and traffic come into play. All of those things get talked about in Windward Oahu all the time. I get calls on all of those issues daily. So if you had uh, one sentence that you could say that would encourage local people to support the Windward side, what would that be? What I would tell folks is just a reminder that all of us, to, in order to live on an island uh, in harmony, we need to co-cool one another. And in order for all of us to succeed, we need to make sure that we co-cool each other and remember that it isn't all about me or just our community, single community. It's really about the entire island. And to remember that, in Windward Oahu, for example, we have four highways. 
we have four tunnels to get to Honolulu, to get back from Honolulu. The folks in Leeward and Central Oahu have but one road in and out. And that's part of the reason why I've supported Honolulu's rail transit system, is that I believe it's Windward Oahu's turn to kokua those folks in Central and Leeward to provide them with the mass transit needs that they require to be able to live in harmony. It must be very interesting because you have very distinct communities. There's we Wamanalo, do. there's Enchanted Lakes, and then Kailua and Kaniohe. How, how do they um, integrate, I guess, or what is, what is a common, common feeling that you get from moving in each of those communities? Well, first and foremost, again, folks in Windward Oahu want to make sure that our lifestyle remains rural and that we do not bring the hustle and bustle of downtown Honolulu and urban Honolulu into Windward Oahu, and we've really tried hard to keep it that way. You might have to block the tunnel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, those folks who have suggested that, I remind them again, you know, we all need to live on this island yeah, in harmony. Yeah, yeah. And just as we want to be able to go into Honolulu, to be able to go to Ala Moana Center, to be able to go to Pearl Ridge and get what we need, at the same time, for those folks who live in Honolulu, who want to come to Windward to enjoy our beaches, to enjoy our mountain trails, we need to welcome them as well. So in order to live in harmony, we have to remember it's all about Kako, we inclusive. And that's a wonderful moment to pause right now in our conversation. And thank you very much for sharing your manat with us. Thank you very much. We've been chatting with council member Ikaika Anderson here at Kekioka Aina Family Learning Center. Thank you for joining me in conversation with Lieutenant Colonel Fred Stadel, who is the Chief of Staff at the Civil Air Patrol. That's a mouthful, sir. <laughs> thank you very much for being so respectful and coming in uniform. And oh, thank you for your invitation. I appreciate it. Share with us a little more about what's the Civil Air Patrol. Sure. We're the official auxiliary of the United States Air Force, and we're congressionally chartered for three primary missions aerospace education, emergency services, and our cadet program for young boys and girls from the sixth grade up. Being the auxiliary of the Air Force means we are part of the total force of the Air Force. Therefore, we wear the, the uniform. We have to meet the Air Force grooming standards. So I, you notice my short haircut. <laughs> and uh, each mission, I can go into it a little bit more detail if you would like. Well, when we talk about a mission, well, you have three purposes. Correct. Uh -huh. Speak briefly about the mission and then I want to learn a little bit more about the youth program. Sure. Emergency services, uh, we can be called upon for search and rescue by the Coast Guard or the uh, local sheriff. Being an, an island community, our biggest mission is hurricane and tsunami warning. Hmm. We fly a fleet of Cessna 182s given to us by the Air Force with special equipment for broadcasting when we're flying low and slow, warning people along the beaches, get to Leave a safe now. place. <laughs> That's right, uh -huh. yes. And then our mission with aerospace education is that we take very seriously the importance of aerospace in our industry and defense for oh. our nation. And we teach our young cadets and ourselves about aerospace education, and we provide this opportunity to our public schools when we're invited as well. Then the cadet program, and I was a cadet when I was a teenager, it well prepared me to be an officer in the Air Force. The cadet program is for young boys and girls from the sixth grade up, and they also wear the uniform of the United States Air Force. They wear the uniform to school? No, they wear it to meetings once a week. It might be on an Air Force base, it might be in a school, and yeah, we have uh, one at at St. Louis, and we have one at uh, Marinol hmm. School, at Hickam, at Wheeler. Is it comparable to a uh, junior ROTC program? Uh, comparable very generally, but with our specific missions, we train in a very specific way, customs and courtesies of the Air Force, as well as leadership and citizenship, which the junior ROTC also does. But our program can actually have a young lady or a young boy, gentleman, fly an airplane all by <laughs> they themselves. They can learn to fly yes. while they're in school. <laughs> the federal regulations say that you can get a pilot's license at 16 wow. in the United States. 
and we have a special encampment where they can go in about six to ten hours learn to fly all by themselves and we invite the mother and father out to watch this that's exciting <laughs> and I think it's a it's a wonderful sounds like a wonderful way to also interest them into going to college into looking not just for the Air Force as a career mm -hmm. but as an avenue of learning. yes in fact 10 about 10 percent of Civil Air Patrol cadets uh, go to the academies, the military academies. And the Air Force so respects our program that if the young person achieves a certain level of accomplishment, they can be enlisted into the Air Force right into basic training with two or three stripes, depending on their level of achievement. That's a lot more money for a brand new recruit and more responsibility. That's how much the Air Force respects our program. It seems that it ties in very well to the mission of public education to prepare them for college and careers and civic engagement in the Absolutely. community. Absolutely. In fact, the first woman to fly F-16 with the Thunderbirds was a Civil Air Patrol cadet. And she went on to become a colonel in the Air Force. Wonderful way to conclude our conversation today. Thank you so much. And thank you. We've been chatting with Lieutenant Colonel Fred Stadel, Chief of Staff with Civil Air Patrol. Thank you for being with us. Momi Akana, who is the director of Keikyoka Aina Family Learning Centers, and I want to thank you for hosting us today. What a, what a beautiful place you must be very proud of. It is a pleasure to have you here. This was part of your dream years ago. We would sit around and envision a place where families could gather and people would be there to teach and the children could just run free and no one would uh, have to worry about safety. And uh, to see it really come to fruition is, is amazing. So a family learning center is one of the settings of early learning, early childhood learning. Can you explain a little bit more what happens here? When you have a setting where parents are supported and empowered to become their child's first and best teacher, you, you've set up a situation where lifelong learning can take place. You've empowered them to look for uh, opportunities to teach their children no matter where they're at. They're at school for just a short period of time and so to create an environment where parents are the focus and children are the beneficiary of really good lifelong learning skills, that's the win-win. And, and we've tried to do it through the focus of culture. And what ages are we talking about? Here? Prenatal, we start our families at prenatal. When a mom knows what to expect before her child even comes, you've set them up for success. So prenatal and through the um, early education programs, those are up through third grade, and now um, with our other programs serving very young fathers who are incarcerated, we serve children of all ages. So when you say culture-based, what does that mean? So what we've done is we've intentionalized um, the use of culture to help our families um, be successful in everything that they do to get their kids ready for school. For instance, if you want your kids healthy, then Hawaiian, great Hawaiian cultural practices with regard to nutrition and being able to teach them la'au, lapa'au, Hawaiian medicinal plants. We've got parents who will come in and know nothing about it and by the time they're done with our classes, they're able to make their own um, uh, rubbing oils from coconut, so their own coconut oil to use to massage their own children and nothing is better um, it, than seeing a whole room full of children, parents and grandparents learning to massage and lomi lomi each other to, to talk about good conversations and good communication. It has just been a wonderful way to get people to reconnect. How brilliant to have a program that's designed for children that's also helping parents parent more confidently. It really is. And I'm just going to say that the most transformational program that we've done, and it's a parent's choice, a number of research-based nat national curriculum that have created, you know, wonderful gains in children's test scores. But the cultural components that are put in alongside, like our board and stone classes where families come together to make a traditional papa and pohaku kuiai, their board and stone to pound poi, those have been 
the best classes to help teach parenting because if you're taking your koi or your blade and you're hitting your board too hard, we can make an analogy to sometimes <laughs> that's what happens when, you know, maybe you're not having a good conversation or a good day with your children. So the lessons of the board have been amazing as well. In closing for this particular conversation that we're having, what's one of the joys besides seeing them laugh and hear this? So when I think back to 10 years ago when we had this vision, 10 years ago during the extreme home makeover, thousands of Hawaii residents and hundreds of contractors and businesses helped to pour into this property to make it what it is today. And I believe that if they looked back at the expansion that's happened, we're on all major islands now, we serve 13,000 people with our family strengthening and educational classes, I just really feel like I want people to know that we thank you, we stewarded it well, and 10 years from now, I can't wait to see what the next <laughs> the next 10 years will bring. Oh, we'll certainly look forward to it as well. Thank, thank, you. thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Lila. We've been chatting with Momi Akana, director of Kekioka Aina Family Learning Centers. Thank you for being with us. This taro lo'i is very important to the program and to this location. Yes, it's very important. What was here before was just a piece of land. But when Momi was here, there was water that was coming out of the, the hillside and said, why not turn it into a lo'i? Oh. With Momi, everything's possible. Yeah. And so the conditions were not at its best, but like our ancestors did, is that you don't complain about it, you make it work. So when we look at this lo'i and, and they look like small taro, mm -hmm. um, are they ready for harvesting or? They are a little late for harvesting, but they are certainly in the harvesting stage and they will be good. And the lo'is are the places also where families work together? The, yes, the families come here with staff and they taught about the different kinds of taro. There were five different varieties of taro in here. Youngsters get a chance to play in the mud. And then we say to moms, leave them alone because it is my class. <laughs> taro is very significant. Taro is very significant. Taro tells us about our past or where we come from. And it, it, it's so nice a story that be, in the Hawaiian creation is that we were smart enough to make sure there was food before the nation comes. <laughs> well, you know, it's hand in hand, right? Food and wellness and family. That's right. Exactly. What a precious place to have it here in Kalihi Valley. It's a wonderful place to have it. It is an oasis for many families. How fortunate we are today to have the opportunity to talk with Dan Kellen, who is the Director for Drama Education with the Honolulu Theatre for Youth. Wonderful to see you again. Nice to be here. Nice to see you again. And it's nice to know that you're still in this position. Uh, I love uh, visiting schools and working with the kids. It's always a, there's always a reinvigoration of my work by, by spending time with them. So fill me in a little bit on, on uh, what's happening now with Honolulu Theatre for Youth. Uh, we're in a really good place. There's a lot of people that are really embracing the work where they do. A lot of schools coming and seeing the productions that we work on. Me and my staff in the education side of it. We um, are working on three different islands across the state, working with about 32, 33 different schools to bring different programs, mostly arts integrated programs, kind of bringing the art as a way to deepen comprehension around other subject areas in the class so the students get a little bit of creative work as well as deepen their own education within the classroom. So what does that look like when you say you and the educators go into classrooms? We engage with some subject level, uh, some subject area that the teachers are interested in, whether it be social studies, science, or whatever. So we try to combine our creative approach to whatever the subject area is. And when we and when we sit down with the kids, we don't sit down. We kind of clear a space and get the kids imagining themselves in the world of whatever the subject might be. Today, I was in a class of fourth grade students who are imagining themselves as ancient Polynesians, <laughs> and they're gonna be leaving their island to voyage across the, uh, the, the ocean to discover new islands and, and what might be there. And we're trying to uh, better understand how it might have been that Hawaiians first came to the islands. So the students immerse themselves as the people of those islands, taking on jobs and, and turning the classroom into the island as a community and how they work together and make those decisions together to move on and explore new worlds. 
in the field of performing arts, you have so much opportunity, but also a lot of leeway. Yeah, certainly. That's the beauty of, of the creative world. And I think the biggest thing is that it's not our leeway, it's the leeway we give to the students. We're really challenging them to be much more creative, critical thinkers that take the material that they're working with, not to just know it, but to understand it, to, to apply it, to make it mean something both um, as a historical record, but also in their own contemporary lives. What does it mean for someone who's setting out to explore new things and you need to survive in a world that you don't know what the challenges are and how you can apply that into your own lives? But you need to be invited into the schools. Need to be invited into schools. The school needs to be a school that says, yes, we value the place of the arts in our child's education. Not only do we want them to be good learners, we want them to be creative learners. We want them to be equipped to face the world that they're going to face so that they can adjust, they can be flexible to whatever comes their way. So when a school turns to us and says, we want to find a new way to reach our students, we're there, ready to go and uh, to dive in with them. My memory of working with you personally mm. years ago is that you really helped us as educators mm. get in touch with our feelings. That's part of it, just being able to know who we are as individuals. You know, often we come in with a, this idea that, you know, learning is just this sectionalized thing so we, we gain knowledge. But the deeper we immerse ourselves in, uh, emotionally, creatively, uh, intellectually as, as learners and people, the more we're opening to learning about the world, embracing the world, and finding our place within it. And that's really important, I think, in education. The deeper it is to us as individuals, the more useful it's going to be in our lives in the future. So as we wrap up this conversation that we're having today. Um, what's one message that you'd like to leave to the public? Believe in the value of the arts. Invite the arts into the classroom. Embrace what that can do for us as future. Our future community, our future society, our, uh, our future, the, the future of the kids that we work with. The more that we engage through the arts, the stronger and more powerful individuals they're going to be. And the more confident and joyful. Completely. completely. <laughs> Enthusiastic with life as you, you are. Yes, exactly. I appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We've been chatting with Dan Kellen, who is the Director for Drama Education with the Honolulu Theater for Youth. Thank you for tuning in to Island Focus. What a pleasure it is to converse with Jessica Yamauchi, who is the Executive Director for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. I appreciate you being here so much. You know, the work you do is so important. As a nonprofit organization, um, how do you survive <laughs> in this climate? In this climate, yes, it, it's definitely an ever-changing climate. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to share a little bit about our organization. Um, we are a statewide nonprofit organization. Um, our institute has been around actually for about 20 years, but we started out as the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii and have done a ton of work around tobacco issues. And about five years ago, really went through a mission expansion process to uh, go beyond just tobacco. We still continue to do the work and the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii is a large program of ours, but now we encompass uh, broader public health issues. The Coalition had federal monies as yeah. well as state monies. Is that still part of your funding source? Yes, so we do, we get um, funds now from the Hawaii Community Foundation that uh, manages the Tobacco Trust Fund, which came from the tobacco settlement um, that occurred. And then we do get some funding from the state, which actually is uh, from federal CDC funds. When you talk about your programs, I know there are, there are many programs there. What is a, a special one that's near and dear to your heart? Our roots are in tobacco, and we still continue to do that. Um, but we also now convene the Obesity Prevention Task Force, um, looking really at how to improve physical activity and nutrition. We really work on policy systems, environmental type changes to impact population. Um, we don't, we're not a direct service organization, and a lot of times people actually confuse us with being the quit line or mm. providing diabetes education, but we really try to move things at a policy level to try and impact population health. And you do work with youth, or at least, you know, yes. I mean, directly. Yes, so we have a youth council, which is part of our Coalition for Tobacco-Free program. Um, and that's, we've been growing that for about the last three years now. And we recruit youth across the state, usually as young as around 14. 
um, all the way through college age. And the youth council, we work with giving them some skills and some education, and we work to empower them to move policy. And they get to choose a policy priority every year that they want to work on at the legislative level. Working with policy can be very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> you have a vision, and then it takes a long time to get things through or to have people understand really what your outcome is intended. Along those lines, what is one of your greatest successes recently? Couple, I have to mention two. Um, I would say our youth council experienced um, early on success uh, when they really worked to raise the age of sale of tobacco to 21. And so we were the first state in the nation to do that. That was huge success. Um, normally bills don't pass that quickly. So that was early success. And then that followed two years of not being able to pass their next priority, which was <laughs> prohibiting smoking in a vehicle when a minor is present. All right. But just this week, they did get to move it on a city level. So city and county of Honolulu just passed it and the mayor signed it on Tuesday and it went into effect. You keep at it. A lot of times you don't succeed on the first try, but we, we keep pushing, we keep educating. And every time you get to have that hearing, it's an opportunity to educate more people on the issue. I remember when I was in the legislature and there was conversation <laughs> about uh, flavored cigarettes being yes. legal for minors and that didn't go anywhere. Right, and so federally um, cigarettes are no longer allowed to be flavored. However, other tobacco products and e-cigarettes where we've really seen a youth uptick um, mm -hmm. in usage do allow flavors and that is something that we are now starting to see other cities across the country start to really push. We're looking to see if that is going to be an endeavor for us in the near future. Well all the best for your efforts and thank, thank you for you. being where you are. Thank you so much. We've been chatting with Jessica Yamauchi who is Executive Director for the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Mahalo to Keikioka Aina Family Learning Centers for hosting us today, and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other.